St. Vincent and the Grenadines and across the Eastern Caribbean, the time is now 8 o'clock. We say good morning and welcome you to our special program, Iron Lasso for the morning edition. Today we've got in studio the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, the Honorable Saboto Caesar, and joining us via Zoom is lead scientist monitoring the Lassifre volcano, Professor Richard Robertson. Gentlemen, good morning and welcome. Pleasant morning to each and everyone. I know that there are persons who are listening all across St. Vincent and the Grenadines and in the diaspora. Pleasant morning again. We are going to have a review this morning of activities which took place at La Soufre over the, the weekend. And I am going to try to patch Professor in right away so that we can address the issues of the, the, the science first. Professor, is he available as yet? Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah, good morning. Good, okay, morning. morning. good morning, everyone. Good morning, Professor. If we can Hi. just uh, begin this morning, Professor, by uh, taking a recap of uh, the activities in <clears> particular <throat> Uh, yes, on the weekend yesterday, and then we look at where we are t t today. Uh, yes, thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see that we have some rain this morning, so, well, overnight, so hopefully it continues. The volcano, like, like uh, I said before, the volcano continues in this pattern of um, earthquake swarms, um, what we call long-period hybrid earthquake swarms. In other words, a lot of these events happening over a short period of time, just, just continuing. And these earthquake swarms are interspersed by, or, or concluded by, not sure if they happen in between, by these explosive events. Um, yesterday at 4.49, I believe, we had the latest one. The gap between these events seems to be increasing. There's no clear, you know, definitive pattern, but we're clearly into a period where you have breaks of, different lengths, when I say breaks, breaks in which it appears not very much is happening physically at the volcano. It's still shaking a lot, that's why we have the earthquakes. But then these breaks, after these breaks, you tend to have an explosive event. The explosions, these explosions so far have not been as vigorous as when the eruption started. Um, they still create eruption plumes. They still have tremendous potential to produce paraclastic flows on the volcano itself. And because of the eruption plumes, they tend to, they, they have the potential to, to put a lot of ash into areas which are occupied. Fortunately, the last set of them has have actually gone towards the west, so that both Barbados and St. Vincent Grenadines have not really had that much ash, if any, as the one yesterday did. We think this pattern of activity where you have earthquake swarms, explosion, earthquake swarms, explosion will continue for some time. There's no indication that it's, it's sort of stopping. If anything, it's, it, it looks like the time period is increasing. And um, the explosions, you could say, sometimes they seem to be smaller. Sometimes they generally seem to have a little bit less energy. So you get the feeling that whatever started this, this, this eruption going is, um, you know, there's a certain amount of weight into it. That said, though, we don't know if there's a new batch of material that's that wants to come through, that's going to come through, so that even if, and, and this is what we might expect, even if, for example, in the coming weeks or so, it either stops, um, it's possible that it, it could go a dome. Even if that happens, I don't think we would be thinking that we are to the woods yet, that it's possible that it could restart, um, that it, when I say restart, that it could go into explosions again and you have a reset because a new batch could come through. So in summary, the activity continues as it has for most of the latter part of the week. Um, and we, we, we really need to continue to monitor it and continue to be vigilant. Hopefully rain means that we could get rid of some of the ash and we could have a, a better day today and a better week, hopefully. Uh, Professor, you uh, speak of uh, earthquakes. I know at one particular mm. time, residents in particular in the red zones were feeling these earthquakes. Yeah. Uh, are these felt uh, close to the volcano only? Uh, the, the kinds of earthquakes that we have in is unlikely to be felt. Um, they are particular kind of earthquakes that are different than the ones that were felt by people. The ones that were felt by people are called volcano tectonic earthquakes. And these are earthquakes that have a similar 
kind of mechanism as the tectonic earthquakes, which people feel, tectonic earthquakes are the big earthquakes in a magnitude four and five and six that we feel from time to time. We often hear that they are offshore or somewhere might be close by St. Vincent. These are not VTs or volcano tectonic earthquakes. These are earthquakes we think related to the movement of magma or the movement of, of fluid or, or, or gas. Um, and they are unlikely to be felt even on the volcano. Um, it would be unusual to have a, a, even a large enough hybrid or long period event that will be felt. So, so no, the earthquakes shouldn't be felt um, by anyone because they are long period hybrid earthquakes. But that said, we have had sometimes during this period, we have had the occasional VT. So far, the VTs that we have had are not sufficiently large in, in size to be felt. So again, you know, it's possible to have a VT that you'll, be felt, that you'll feel, but it's unlikely that you'll feel the hybrid or the long period events, which dominate the kind of earthquake activity that we have in, in between the explosive periods. Yes, Professor, um, the, in, in your analysis, there are periods of heightened activities and there's a period of a lull. Yeah. Now, we were not able to move a good percentage of the animals in the red zone. And there are many farmers who are in the shelters who evacuated. And we have advised them that the, the red zone is still a no-go. We visited the areas on the, the windward side of the red zone on the weekend and we recognize that a lot of the animals are still alive and uh, basically they they need some some caring so what the government is doing is that we in a very organized manner we are taking we're using the vehicles from the ministry of agriculture to take feed and water to these animals because the the availability of grass definitely is an issue because of the heavy ash fall. Now, the farmers are becoming very anxious, and I'm wondering, on your advice, in these periods of the lull, whether or not we can, in an organized way, probably have a few farmers go into this area. I don't know what, what the advice is. For, as for now, we're advising persons not to go into the red zone at all. Right. I mean, it once one understands that there is always a risk to go in on the volcano and anywhere in the red zone is always going to be a dangerous place one once one understands that if the pattern continues that we're seeing there would clearly be periods when not very much is happening in the volcano and that if if one can you know if you can organize it such that you know the people check with the observatory or the parties you know you, you have to organize it such that maybe you have groups of people people who are in touch with the observatory who know um, who can contact us or who can be contacted if something changes. It can be organized such that you can minimize the risk to people and, and therefore you can do certain kinds of activity. I think it is a possibility. It, it's something that can be looked at, that can be organized, and it would, would make sense to do so given what you've just described. But that said, it really needs to understand that people need to understand that even when doing that, there is always a risk. Um, it's just that what you're trying to do is minimize the risk by, by um, doing activity in a particular manner. So yes, it's something that could be considered that as, 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 um, can be done in an organized manner. Um, but you have to, you, you know, it, 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 as I said, you, you have to bear in mind, the, 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 um, you have to trade off between the risk versus the benefits of doing that. And, and it's something that I would recommend you work closely with, with the, the, um, the observatory in terms of managing that kind of activity. Yes. The second question, there is significant anxiety, of course, as you were anticipating, mm. the farming community, farmers from the, from the red zone and even from the, from the orange zone as well, as it pertains to the future of heavy ash fall. And right. it is something that we are advising persons, it may be a bit too soon to attempt to do any reparatory work or any work on your farms because it could be an exercise in futility. You can go into your farms and you could start replanting in, let's say, the, the orange zone, and then you can have significant ash fall and basically your, your, your work, you'd have to do it all over. What is the level of uncertainty in terms of the future of heavy ash fall? Um, it's difficult to quantify that, but, but there are... They are ways in which one can can um, sort of get a, a better idea of that um, and it's not the ash fall to the south 
it's related, yes, fundamentally to what the volcano is doing. So if you have an explosive event, there is, you, you need an explosive event to generate the asphalt. So that's the, that's the motivating factor. But it's also related to the, the meteorological conditions, you know, um, where the wind is blowing. Uh, so, so that one can can come up with models that tell you what is the chances of having a certain kind of wind pattern that will generate the conditions for ash to come to the south. Um, and and there, there are people actually we have we've recently been reaching out to colleagues in the UK who who do that kind of modeling to get a better idea of if an event happens, um, can it come south? Is it going to come south? So. So I think there, there's, there's some work that can be done in terms of quantifying that uncertainty. There's not, not an absolute number that I can give you in terms of how, how unsure it is. The most I can say that if generally, in most cases, I, I, I think the ash goes offshore. In rare cases, it comes to the south. The reason you had so much ash on, on, at the beginning of the eruption is because of the nature of the activity that happened. The volcano went into a very intense period of explosive events that generated a significant amount of ash and very high ash plumes that went high into the atmosphere. And once you do that, everywhere on the island could potentially have ash. The kind of activity that you have in now, the, 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 the way in which you will get ash is if you have a suddenly wind, a dominantly suddenly wind. And, and as you see, since we have gotten into sort of the, the events that are more volcanian, more discrete, less jetting constantly of ash on, and, and material from the volcano, you've had less occurrence of ash going to the south. So I'll say it's difficult to quantify the uncertainty. I'll say also that if the activity as it is continues, I think there's a, a lower chance of having ash to the south than you had at the beginning. Um, and, and, and thirdly, for you to get to the kind of activity that you had at the beginning, you will need we think, to have a new batch of magma coming through. So all indications are that there is probably, and, and you can put a number in it, there is probably a marginally a lower likelihood of having ash to the south, given the current kind of activity they have. But that activity pattern could change. So um, I think one of the things that, that could be considered, and, and I have mentioned it before, is to work with, with you know, people at, at, at in the Agriculture Department, uh, Faculty of Agriculture in the Ministry of in the, um, at UV at, at St. Augustine, who have done work on re rehabilitation of land that have been affected by ash. There are people who are knowledgeable about that. So there, there may be things that you can do now, um, quite apart from your talk about replanting and stuff like that, things that you can do with the conditions as it is to perhaps get the land to a state where it, it, it would be better prepared for the time when you can, can fully get into um, you know, production. Because as it is now, with the heavy amount of ash that you have in the land, I suspect that um, it will be difficult for, for crops and for plants to sustain themselves without doing something about, um, I'm not an uh, um, agronomist or, or somebody who's supposed to next agriculture, but it might be difficult given the volume of material that you have. You'll have to deal with that volume first before you get to this stage of, of, of production, perhaps. Um, in some areas. So I think that's some of the things that you have to do. So I'm not sure if I, I completely... Um, yes, yes. Because, I, because I from, from, from all, all cursory analysis, uh, between the areas, for example, from Rabaka, Dry River, all the way up to, to Sandy Bay, we saw instances where there were two feet of ash right. on the ground. Now, we are in the process of, of testing the the elements that are in the in that in the ash and uh, it's something that we can work together on because we're doing some work to to send some of the the ash to trinidad and tobago so that we can get a an analysis done there now the 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 idea is that and this is from a preliminary sense if we can probably plow it in using the tractors because as mm -hmm. you correctly said to plant something in into feet of ash, it's not going to be productive. That's what the agronomists have advised. But before we do anything, we need to get the analysis done in Trinidad and Tobago yeah. and get the results. I, I don't know if you have any examples of what pertained in Montserrat as the, the recovery efforts and the replanting after heavy ash fall, probably months or even a year 
in, in areas that, that were severely affected by, by ashfall in Montserrat? Um, not, not directly, but I suspect that you, you uh, through your, your um, through ECS and places like that, you, you, can, you can get advice from the ministry in Montserrat. Um, that said, you should bear in mind that the, the material that was produced in Montserrat in terms of the ash, the kind of the composition of the rock is slightly different than ours. We are more um, what we call basaltic, and they are more closer to andesite. So slightly different. So and, and the conditions are slightly different. But but I, I I think the best thing would be to reach out to the the Ministry of Agriculture there. Um, the the thing I would say is that often I mean things things rebuild the land rebuilds itself very fast. Um, really, what it needs is a good rainy season, and it it changes rapidly. So I suspect that a lot will change after the rainy season has passed this year, that, that, and that the land itself and the ability to rehabilitate the land would, would be significantly improved um, once you start getting some rain. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very positive about, the, the, fact, about the, the, the effect that the ash would have. It's actually, in the end, the ash, although it's a nuisance now and it's very thick, the ash is going to have a, a, a positive effect in terms of the agriculture in St. Vincent because the, the minerals that you have, they, they do, I mean, that's the fact that we have um, great land for agriculture and, 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 and conditions yes. here, right, is, la is partly to do the, the, the volcanic materials. So I think in the end it will be very positive. But I, I think moving in that direction where you, where you research it and, and find out that that's a good idea. Yes, it's actually very interesting that we were going into a, a dry spell just before we had the first explosive mm -hmm. eruption. And I, I don't know if you could shed some light on the impact of all those dust particles by the explosive eruption and the impact on, on rainfall. Because some persons are saying that mm -hmm. it may be anticipated that it can be dry and that can have the impact of creating a, almost a microclimate in and around the yeah. island because of the heavy ash presence in the air. Yeah, I mean... I, 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 I can't say I know that much about it. I do know that the, in the fine ash particles, the very fine particles tend to, tend to get, you know, they get very high into the atmosphere and they, and they get lost. The, 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 the thing that you're speaking about is the suspended ash, the remo removalized ash. Um, I, I don't think that would affect too much the, the, the local climate um, because it has affected by more things above. And I think, and I think what, what's going to happen is that once you have a little bit of rain, in fact, like today, when you had a little bit of rain, where I'm here um, in the north, the the, um, the haziness that we normally see from the remobilized ash is already gone. So that that changes quite rapidly. I think the thing that might have affected sort of more the the, the creation of clouds and things like that is the particles that went higher up. And I think those those have more or less gone with the wind already. Um, but that said, you know. I, that's not my area of expertise, so, so I'm kind of just um, largely guessing what I think else. Yes, the, the issue of the pyroclastic flows, because I have the responsibility mm -hmm. for, for, for forestry as well. Right. Uh, could, could you explain to us like what, what areas were mainly affected? Because um, the persons yeah. who, are, who are listening who would like to, to, to be up to speed with, with, with that information. Right. So, I mean, from what we see, the, 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 mark, the area of, 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 of most devastation on the volcano um, are, the, are the areas that go from sort of, you can take an area from, from sort of Wallabo, Richmond area, and you on the, on, the, on the west coast, and you go north all the way to just south of Balen, north of Larakai, in between Larakai and Balen, I mean, I'll say half in between, just, just north of Larakai. And then if you take, that's the coastal area, and if you if you take a sort of a, a, a um, make that into a triangle that, that ends up at the at the, at the at the crater, those are the areas that are, are affected in the greatest way. And, and when I say the effect, the effect is that up at the top of the volcano, sort of I would guess the, the top um, two or three, probably top one or two miles, probably a little bit less than that, there is almost total destruction of plant life. Um, there's a lot of ash. Um, there are no trees. If there are any trees, there are stumps of trees. Um, the, the leaves have been, uh, been broken now. But then as you go lower down, you might see a, a few more trees, most of it, mostly lower level, um, you know, plants and, 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 and um, 
plant life is, is totally destroyed and covered in ash. But you may see some rare um, trees every now and then. I suspect they're just really the, the barks and, and they will eventually die. So those are the areas where the forest essentially has been um, destroyed to a large extent. Uh, it will have to be rebuilt. When you move north now from Balen, in fact, Balen, last time I saw Balen, it was, it was fairly, you know, in, it's in, the forest was still there. It was in good condition. If you go from Balen all the way around to Fancy and then you're coming back south, I mean, things are, think the forest is still largely intact as you get to the, to the lower end, as you get outside from the crater itself. Um, and, and it's only when you start coming back south, you know, past, um, you know, Sandy Bay and, and places like that, that, you start getting sort of more of the kind of devastation to the, to the, to the coastal areas, close to the coastal areas. It's not clear what's happened higher up. So, so the, the maximum area that has been, the area that's been devastated in the, in the, in the most is really the southwest, the south, south, the southwestern, south, southwestern area going all the way up to the sort of northwest. Um, the rest of it is mainly ash in terms of the plastic density currents. So the, the area that is edified, the area that has been totally, um, you know, new deposits have been wiped out completely, and that's the area where the forest would need to rebuild. Yes. Um, whilst every eruption is, is different, mm -hmm. but you can have trends, in, in 1902, 1979, and what you're seeing now, they, mm -hmm. you would have seen dome formations at the, the end of an eruption or a lake being formed. Mm -hmm. um, what pertained in 1902-79? And, of course, it's too early to predict what was going to happen now. But in terms of the formation of a dome, remember, I remember going to La Sofre as as a youngster. And uh, persons who had gone up to La Sofre, let's say 1982, would have witnessed either a smaller dome, and I used to hear a person saying that it is growing. Of course, I couldn't mm -hmm. understand or fathom what they were speaking about, but I could just imagine if there's a dome there, let's say, starting to grow in, in 2023, and I go back there in 2040, that it would have grown. It will be growing. Um, could you explain that a, a bit, and then we'll take the call? In terms of how, right. how, how so, have we historically transitioned from an eruption to uh, a crater lake or the growth of a dome mm. before right. moving so, into a quiet uh, period? You, you could take up these erupts. Yeah. So you could take up these eruptions, and eruptions generally are being driven by um, gas rich magma that has come from below. That, for whatever condition, the, the conditions have been become such that the, the chamber in which they are, they, are, they, are, they are derived from have become what we call overpressured. It's developed sufficient pressure that it can push upwards and, and move to the surface. And that, that gas rich magma will then punch a hole at the surface, um, generally create a crater, uh, a hole through which magma would, 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 would vent. And, and generally, once it's gotten rid of a large amount of its gas, it then starts moving slower. It, it, it's, it's, it, what we say it's viscosity or, or its stickiness increases. And once that starts happening, um, you know, the, the gas, well, the gushing initially, when it's gas rich, gets rid of a lot of the gas. But then once it starts moving slower, the gas comes out slower. It eventually cools a lot. Well, not so much cools, but because it's moving slow, it, it, as it moves slow, the, the top part of it, it sort of, you could think of it, the, the part that is closest to the surface, cools down, and it begins to form, um, it begins thickier, it becomes more like rock, and it could potentially form a dome, right? Um, and often, in, in Soufre terms, what, that's one of the ways in which it has ended this eruption with this dome forming. So this dome gets bigger and bigger, and the mass of the dome, and also because it doesn't have so much gas-rich magma below it, then essentially it forms a cap that stops the eruption, and that's the end. And, and in a sense, that's what happened in 79 years, to a large extent, you know, the, the, the gas which part went on, yeah, the explosive period, and then a dome ended. It ended with a dome, which was a part that didn't have so much gas and therefore moved slowly, stiffened, we created a mass of rock that effectively flooded. Um, in, in 1902, it, it didn't create a dome. It ended, it ended with, with, with a crater that then, when water falls, when rain falls, and there's a lot of rain up there, the, 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 the crater essentially becomes a collecting point where a cauldron where um, water collects and you have a dome, a, a, a crater lake being formed, a lake being formed. So the lakes form when um, the gas-rich magma is exhausted without having any more left 
to come up or, or, or else it actually came up but it didn't quite reach the surface so effectively it seals the bottom of the of the um the opening and creates the conditions for the lake to form in cases where it has enough gas which might want still to push all the way up it then cools and you might have or, or you have enough magma sorry the gas is gone it's the gas it doesn't have too much gas it then forms a dome you have a dome at the end and it's something that happens um, so those are the, the, so the conditions of, of the determinant of whether or not you have a crater versus whether or not you have a dome. As a, and, and, and in fact, whether the option ends with crater or dome has to that extent with the, the amount of gas rich magma you have and um, how it gets rid of that gas. What, what we really need in, in eruptions is that we need the gas to come out, the gas, it come out um, easily. It, we need the magma to the gas without pressure building up that sufficiently that it then explodes. Um, and in fact, coming back to what's happening now, I think the, the, working, um, the working model, if you want to call it, in other words, how we think about what is happening currently, um, scientifically, is that this gas fish magma that, that gushed out at the beginning of the eruption, it's gotten rid of a lot of the gas that came up during that first period. That's why it was so vigorous. It was so vigorous because it was under pressure and it had a lot of gas in it and it was really exploding. Now, a lot of it is gone. So now, as a lot of it is gone, the driving force is less, so that it's moving, it's the gas in freely still, but it's moving a little bit slower. And if it starts doing that, effectively it starts stiffening up and it starts stopping itself from moving. And what, what we think is happening over the last couple of days is that it's stiffening up and it's stopping itself from moving, it's building up enough pressure that it then fragments and it causes an explosion. So it, in a sense, it's kind of trying to form a dome, but then conditions are changing and it's exploding the dome. Um, if, if this is correct, what we think is correct, what, what is likely to happen is that at the end of the eruption, you're going to probably have, well, at the end of this phase of the eruption, certainly you will have a dome. Whether or not this is the end in terms of that's it and the eruption is done, something that we all would like to see. Um, you know, we'll have to wait and see because it's possible that there may be another pulse of material that is below the surface, that be deeper down that we haven't seen yet, that tries to come through and really is whether or not it gets through this cap, that would now, now be there. One of the interesting things that we determined from this eruption is that Soufre seems to be very good at, at locking in gas. It, it's, not a, it's not a volcano that, that, um, that has a lot of pathways for gas to come to the surface. Because of the, the nature of the volcano, we have, we have a, vol a mountain that is built up of layers of hard rock and loose material. And the hard rock seems to be really, really hard. So they're very good at, at tapping the gas in. And the gas is only able to come out through very small pathways, you know, like, uh, you know, you, 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 when, the, when the opening was at the beginning, where the dome was coming out, that was the only place we saw really truly volcanic gases coming out. A lot of the other areas is just steaming. So if, if a dome comes up and caps it again, it means that it's going to stop the gas from coming out. And, and one scenario is that it will stop the eruption. The other one is that it will cause pressure to build up sufficiently that it will get... Um, into that. I, I, I sort of give you a long-winded answer to your question. No, no, it's, 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 it's <laughs> really good. It's really good. Um, now, going around in the different communities and meeting persons who basically lived through 1979, they are all saying that what happened now is, is totally different. It's In fact, it's, it's more intense. It's far yeah. worse in terms of the impact. And I can recall you noting very early up that when you compare what is taking place now, it's more of a 1902 type. I don't know if I had gotten it right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. What basically are the comparisons between now and 1902? Right. So um, I don't think it's quite gotten to <clears throat> sort of the, the volume of material that was produced in 1902 yet. But I think the comparison was really to do with the intensity of the explosions, particularly the beginning of the eruption. The 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 intensity of those explosions that happened from Friday until about Sunday was was nothing compared was nothing similar to '79. It was much more intense, and it was closer essentially to what some of the explosions and some of the periods they had in 1902. So that's where the comparison comes. But in terms of the the total amount of material, and and um, we don't think it's quite there. And and volcanologists um, use different measures to quantify the size of an eruption. So you could think of it in terms of vigor of activity, in terms of force, in terms of explosivity. It certainly was more so 
closer to 1902 than 1979 because the, the none of the none of the um, 1979 eruptions um, explosions were bigger than than some of the some of the explosions that you had at the beginning. Um, they were closer to the explosions you have since you have had since then, like the one in the 13th, um, the one the other evening. Those are the kind of size of explosions you had in 79. And 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 the people will see that because <clears throat> you could see the effect that it had. Um, you didn't have so much ash in the south. Um, you didn't have so much of the areas devastated. For example, in 79, the pyroclastic flows only went on um, some parts of Rabaka, Larakai, the higher parts of, of, of um, Walabu, and things like that. Right now, within a week of the eruption, you've had pyroclastic flows that have gone on to the sea in Walabu, Roso, all of the valleys, all the way up to, to Larakai. That is close to what happened in 1902. But as I said, it's not quite there yet, I think, because in 1902, the, the destruction in terms of the volcano itself was much more extensive. So while now the pyroclastic flows and the damage to a large extent is still in the valleys um, along the area that I spoke about, I mean, the forest is damaged and destroyed to a large extent. In 1902, you would have had that and you would have had really much more deposition of ash in those areas. So you, you had, a, in a sense, in 1902, the, the, the landscape from, say, Richmond all the way north to, to, to Larakai and, and beyond was just covered with like a moonscape with just ash. There was nothing, no trees taken up. Um, there was a huge amount of ash and debris. We haven't gotten to that stage yet. We hope we don't get to that stage. But certainly, I, I agree with people. I mean, if you lived through 79, you would have seen that this, what we saw at the beginning, was certainly uh, much more explosive and much more dynamic and different than 79. Yes, um, I remember going to walk into along God, Garden Street in Trinidad, yeah. where I went to um, law school, and there was the, the research unit on the left, the left hand side of the road there. Yes, <laughs> and and I used uh, you, to. You didn't you didn't come to visit us? Did I, you? I, I, I didn't know you were there, <laughs> and I remember every morning passing there and saying. I wonder what work is going on there and what recent mm. information. That was between 2003 to 2005. Right. Yes. Now, I'm, I'm using that as the background because I know that you, you place a lot of equipment on different parts of the, 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 the summit and different areas are in, mm. in and around the volcano. And that was yes. before the eruption. Now, yes. in terms of damage, wear and tear, what, what are the sorts of, um, of damage and wear and tear you think that you have experienced? Because I don't know if, ever, if everything is still working. I'm just asking general. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, your, 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 your question gave me a chance to, to really, well, well, you know, to big up <laughs> the team that, that, yes. that um, work at Seismic. Because when we came up, when I came up initially, I came up with Lloyd Lynch and Ian Juman, and they, they worked closely with, with Cameron and Price at the Super Monitoring Unit to put in what is the core of the monitoring network, which allows us to do what we're doing now. They put in the seismic instruments. And we put in stations at, at two stations on the mountain, one right at the summit, one at a place called Wallaboo. We put in stations along the perif periphery, Fancy, Owea, Georgetown. Um, and, and we then had a network that moved from essentially one station, um, because then it was just Belmont, to one that had, at, at, at one time, I think um, nine, close to nine, eight or nine stations. Um, you ask somebody the, the, the damage and destruction. Um, and, and, and before I go from that, I mean, they, it was a lot of work. Um, you know, it, it meant physically carrying stuff up the mountain. It meant working in areas that, that were hard. I remember at one, on one night, we were using a helicopter, and the guys in them got stranded up there because the helicopter dropped them off, and it couldn't get back in. And they hadn't prepared to walk out. So they had to essentially walk up the volcano and then walk back down again in the dark. And that, that's his stuff. Um, so, you know, much appreciation for them for that. For that. So damage. Um, I think we've been fortunate in that so far. Um, we've, we've lost, as I, as I speak, I'm looking at the, the records, and, and we have three stations out. And we think it's only one of them is actually um, damaged by the volcano. The one that is um, within probably uh, less than a mile from the summit. Uh, you know, if you, if you go up the summit um, on, the, on the windward side, and you go around to a place we call Table Rock, um, and, and you continue around a little bit far until you, a little bit further until you reach sort of the southern side and go down a ridge, which is probably about two or 300 meters from the, from the rim. That's where that was. Unfortunately, we think that's where quite a few of the paraclastic 
flows that went in the direction of Rabaka, basically it's on a ridge, and I think the pyroclastic flow go down both paths, right? Yes. Now, we think it might be damaged, um, but we lost it longer than that, earlier than that, because the solar panels which power it were covered in ash, and of course we couldn't go to clean solar panels because it was already <laughs> erupted. So um, that's the only station we think is actually physically damaged. We don't have the other two, but we don't have the other two mainly because of power issues. So the one in Fancy is largely because there's an issue with power um, at Fancy. That is power to the communications link that bring us in. So the station is working still, but we can't get the data in because of power to the mechanism to bring it in to, to us here in Belmont. Um, and then the one in Owe, we think is a similar thing, that it has to do with, with, with power to, for the communication. So it's possible, luckily, that we have all of the, the seismic stations that we put in apart from one. In terms of the other stations, though, um, as people know, we had put in a station on, on the southwestern side to look at failure of the crater wall. We put in this EDM and we had a camera. Well, that went within the first, the first um, explosion because that was right at the rim. So that, you know, the, the, the camera was quite useful until the night before the first explosion. Um, and the EDM reflector already was half, having a hard time with the, the conditions up there. And, um, and I think it's gone. We, we don't have any evidence of that, but it's right in the rim. So that's gone. Um, the, the, other, the other stations that we have, similarly, we have other GPS stations at Fancy. So that's affected by the power issue. Um, apart from that, there, there are two other stations that we would have occupied that we didn't have, we didn't have equipment there but we would have gone back to put equipment. I see one at Tabor Rock, which is again at the summit. And then there's a one at a place called Jacob's Well, halfway up the summit. Yeah. So for ex obvious reasons, we have not gone to the volcano because we think it's too risky. As, as you saw yesterday, um, we were monitoring. And, and yes, we know we're into this period where you could have explosions, but we didn't know exactly when the explosions are going to be. So it would be foolish for us to go up to the summit at this time. Uh, I mean, and, and, and as I said, your, your, your question gave me the chance to make that point. That it is absolutely foolish. Um, you know, with yes, because I'm a, a, a member of the Christian dotish, Council. Right? A you know, member of the Christian. A member of the Christian um, Council just sent that um, yes, question to me to absolute, basically yeah, reiterate absolutely that point. Dotish to do that. Um, you know, people talk about bravery, and to me, somebody is brave when you when you are aware of the the risk that you put yourself to, and because of some some um, because of your job or because of the need to contribute to society in a fundamental way, you still take the action or the need to save your family or something like that. So you are aware of the risk. You know you could be killed or you know you could be hurt, but you still do it. That's a brave person. A brave person is not somebody who goes up to the mountain, who don't understand the risk, um, putting themselves and their parties at risk, and the people who might have to rescue them. That person is not brave. To me, that person is just simply dotish. Um, so I would suggest that Actions like that is not sensible. At this time, you know, you, you're a I minister mean, of government. At this time, I think, in, for, for me, people in Simmons need to be, to be brave, to be brave to what we have to face. We have to face a country in which we have had tremendous, we will have tremendous destruction because of the volcano. And we have to be brave to face the circumstances. We have to be very brave to realize that if we want to live in this land that is really beautiful, we have to deal with the volcano, we have to deal with the hazards. We have to be brave to protect our family. That is brave. We're up the mountain at this point in time where you could be killed and where you could get people which you kill, or you could inspire people who see you and think that that is a sensible thing to do the same thing. That is not brave, people. That is brutish. And that's what I would call it. I'm sorry if I offend anybody in using that kind of language. <laughs> no, no, I see no, no, Professor. Um, because a question came in from a member of the Christian Council to basically reiterate to the population, to citizens, not to venture there. And uh, you basically brought it out before me even, yeah. me even going there. I had that one to minister. Yes. No, no, in, in many persons' minds, they, they are basically asking, persons are looking for certainty in an uncertain yeah. period. Yeah. And of course, persons are anxious. There's been disruptions, displacements in all the factors of production. Land has been disrupted, labor, capital, foreign direct investors. And I think that the, the only general comparison that we have is, is what basically took place in, in Montserrat. And, and yeah. persons are wondering. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may not even be a good comparison, yeah. but they're saying, yeah. 
How long did Montserrat take before it returned to a state of normalcy? Is Montserrat still still erupting? What's happening there? Can we get some mm. guide? It's very right. difficult to have a guide. Right. But for persons yeah. who are asking, I know that there are a lot of students who are listening to this program and a lot of students. I mean, it will be an excellent opportunity if you're a CXC or, or a level student to do play tectonics as your number one question and not weather. <laughs> but there, there are persons who would like to know, um, you know, yeah. what was it like in Montserrat? How long it took to, to return to a, a state of normalcy? Yeah, well, I, I think the comparison in Montserrat, while, while it is up because of a volcano, it's different because Montserrat fundamentally is different than in, this, in the context that the development and the developed area in Montserrat was inverse. So it's like if our capital in the context of Montserrat was in Georgetown or in um, even further in Chartres-Belay. So Montserrat, its main development was on or very close to the volcano. So it meant that in terms of the disruption that the volcano caused, it was even more, it was even greater. We, our main development is in the south. So there's a lot that we could do in the country while the volcano is doing what it's doing. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the kind of volcanism, the kind of way in which the volcano is erupting in Montserrat, Ours op operate differently. We tend to have eruptions that go on for shorter periods of time. So therefore, the disruption that will be caused by this volcano is going to be likely much less than the disruption in terms of impact continually of the volcano on people's lives than in Montserrat. Montserrat's eruption um, is still considered by the scientists monitoring it at the Montserrat volcano, Free, who are giving tremendous support to us with this, with this eruption. Montserrat eruption is still considered, given what they have seen, to be ongoing. Uh, they are still having signs and signals that is coming out from the monitoring that suggest that it's not quite settled back yet. Um, but in terms of the most intense period, Montserrat's most intense period was perhaps um, went on for about two or three years. We are extremely, we are very unlikely to have that. We are, we are likely to have something that is more of the order of, of months, perhaps, um, almost a year, if so long, in 1902. I was making a comparison 1902. This is similar to 1902, not quite yet. But 1902 went on for about a year. But the way in which it went on was that it wasn't like it was constantly doing something. It was more like what we have in now, where you had periods when you had explosions and periods when it was apparently quite quiet. And most of the ash that happened in the south happened, you know, intermittently. It wasn't like you constantly had ash. In the case of Montserrat, essentially you had a volcano that, first of all, was erupting right next to the capital. And I had a volcano that put out a lot of ash right next to the capital, right next to the area where they have the main farm in agriculture, infrastructure, everything was there in the south. So the disruption that it caused was much more. In terms of going back to normal, I think once they made a serious decision to shift towards the north in Montserrat, um, and you know, understandably that decision was hard to make because I mean, if you think of it, if, if we had the same thing, if, 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 if you had to tell people in St. Vincent that Kingstown and the southern part of St. Vincent suddenly have a volcano and they have to move to the north. <laughs> that would be extremely difficult. Nobody wants to do that. So in the case yeah. of Montserrat, it took a long time for that decision to be made. So therefore, I think the extent to which the disruption caused by the volcano was felt was affected by that too, not only the volcano. In our case, I have been saying for some time, and we've been saying here at Seismic Center for some time, that once the volcano is erupting, you need to leave it alone. So don't think as much as you can, you need to find a way in which you can live in the south for those people who are here. Don't, don't be thinking now that you're going to go back tomorrow and next week and that like. Think like you're in for a long haul, right? I'm hoping that it might not be so because even if it stops erupting now, it might be a little while before we are certainly monitoring team is confident that it's safe to go back. That's the first thing. Secondly, the impact that it has had on the, on the land would require rebuilding. So even in terms of moving back to utilize the land, even if it stopped, there will be some time. So the best thing is to for us to, yes, you could use the Montserrat example, but I'm saying that the Montserrat example is probably not so apt because it's less among the time. It's a positive thing. But to think about how can we sustain life and livelihoods in the southern part of the country for a, a little bit longer than we would like, yes, you know, for at least months. Right? Not, not weeks, not next week, not next week after that. We think in months, you know. And if we do that, then if it's less than that, then we can move back faster. Um, if it's yeah. more than that, then we have built the foundation upon which we could sustain that while the volcano is doing. Because as long as the volcano 
is capable of producing explosive eruptions. It will be difficult for people to live there safely. Um, so therefore, I think that's, that's how we have to think here and, and come up with solutions for that. Come up with solutions that deal with the ash that might happen again, um, water supply, that kind of thing. Once we do that, I think we should be good and we should be positive that this is eventually the volcano is going to go back to first be, going to become the beautiful place that it was where we go for Easter Monday and, and that kind of thing. You know, we might end up with a crater lake. We might end up with a nice stove. You know, <laughs> it'd be a fantastic attraction for tourism, for various things. Yes. And of course, now that the whole world about Sufre, we could capitalize on that. It's a, it's, there's some largely positive elements. It's just that we have to rough it out for these this, this times. It's going to be tough. It's going to be adjustments. We just have to do that. That's why when I talk about bravery, that is brave. You have to be brave like that. Yes. Okay. I don't know if you have any, any parting words. I have just a few announcements to make, but um, those are touching and concerning agriculture primarily. Yeah. So I will give you a minute or so to, to wrap up, and um, yeah. I will basically continue after. Right. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I just want to reiterate to people that, that you have a monitoring team here that's going to keep a close eye on the volcano. Um, you know, I happen to be the face at this point in time. It's going to change at different times. <laughs> but, but we have a large team that, it's not me alone, it's not three of us alone, that's monitoring the volcano, keeping a close eye on it. So therefore, Vincentians need to be confident that you have a set of scientific people here who are going to be giving you advice soundly in terms of what you should or should not do. My sound advice to you is to learn to live in the South for the time being. My sound advice to you is not to go up on the mountain. Um, as I said, I use a term, and I hope people remember that term. Use it to the person who's doing it. It's dotish. I, my sound advice to you is to be brave, not to be dotish. <laughs> Live in the South, keep safe, and we should be good. You sound in real, Vinci, comrade. Professor, you're trending already. <laughs> All right. Thank All you right, very perfect. much. Enjoy the rest All of the day and continue easy. to do the excellent work. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right, yes. Professor, yeah. thank you. All right, what is this over to you? Yes, I really want to thank Professor for the excellent work that he is doing and, and, and his team. And I just want to use the, the, the remaining few minutes to address a few issues in agriculture. And first of all, I want to address uh, the livestock subsector. On Friday last, we launched a, a program to assist livestock farmers throughout the country with animal feed because of the heavy ash cover a lot of animals have not been able to to get the the, the grass available because the pastures are definitely affected and uh, there are several points throughout the the country and they were advertised and i'm aware that close to 1500 farmers registered for the support as it pertains to livestock feed these these farmers some farmers received and uh, others will be getting their their feed on tuesday which is tomorrow the feed mill wasn't able to produce the quantities that that we needed we have allocated the sum of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards the purchasing of, of feed and we were only able to collect about seventy five thousand dollars worth i think we have a caller Okay. The, the second issue has to do with the launch of the food package program that has been established and it started last week, Thursday. And at the La Croix buying depot, farmers who are willing to sell produce to the government for repackaging purposes to be distributed in boxes to different persons in different communities who are now food vulnerable, they can do so. This will take place between Monday to Friday, Monday to Thursday, sorry, of each week. Farmers are asked to prepare these products in terms of having them washed and take them there. It's basically it's, it's similar to what pertained in the love box initiative the i want to take this opportunity also to thank the government and people of guyana yesterday i, I witnessed the offloading of tons of fresh produce from guyana mainly melons pineapple and a lot of pumpkins and these were all sent to the different shelters 
around St. Vincent and the the persons who locally are growing fresh produce and assisting the shelters. So there are persons, there are, there are farmers who will participate in the, the program of selling produce to the facility there at Lacqua for repackaging. But I, I want to really thank all those farmers who have volunteered and brought produce and made it available at, at no cost. There is a caller now. Yes. Yes. Good morning, caller. Yes. Is Minister Caesar available? Yes, please, he is. Yes, Sir, Sir Louis. Good morning. Yes, good morning. I seem to understand. Yes. Hello? Go right ahead, Minister. Yes. That I seem to understand that um, Dr. Robinson is saying that in Montserrat, the period of uncertainty and instability remained there for about three years. Yes. Now, he said in St. Vincent, it would last for about a year or maybe even more. The question is, if that is so, does that mean that the modern diagnostic center and the um, smart hospital in Georgetown, those institutions will be out of commission for at least one year? Okay, well, well, what he basically said from a, a general standpoint is that we should try to see how we can live in the South yes. as much as possible yes. and to, to have a state of normalcy in living in the South. But that he will be able to tell us how soon we can return to a state of normalcy in, in the North. He said that it could be weeks, it could be months, it could be a year. It's very uncertain. But at the end of the day, what we must try to do now is to see how normal we can live on the island living in the south. So I, I take it that the predictability about disruptions in, in the north right now is, is still high. And it is too early to, to make a decision. However, as policymakers, we have to create levels of certainty. And... Uh, the question that you raise, because the, those are two very important institutions, I, I am aware that um, a lot of the services have already moved to the south, and it's being operationalized in the south. The question is, how soon do we repatriate to the, the north? And that is something that we have to await his advice. Thank you. Yes. And definitely... That is the question that is going to be on our minds as policymakers, the issue of land use, because a significant portion of the, the flat lands in St. Vincent and the Grenadines reside in the north of the Rabaka River. And uh, we have a large cadre of farmers also there. I know that most... Well, 98% of the arrow root produced in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is produced in that area as well. So that is an industry that has been hit very hard, and we have to see how we are going to address the, the way forward. I'm also aware that the cocoa subsector has been significantly affected, and a lot of the, the, the new cocoa plantations that we have are also located in the red zone. So these are issues that, that we have to address going forward. We have another caller, Minister. Yes, we, are, we have another caller. Pleasant morning. Hello, good morning. Roboto? Yes, good morning. Yeah, um, relocation and reconstruction in the south is, it would be very vital, especially now, knowing the uncertainty of um, what's going to happen in the north. And um, so we mentioned a while ago about the hospital out there. Can we fast forward plan to establish the modern hospital in Annisville? Is this a good opportunity to put everything in place to have that established? Thank you. So I just want to thank the caller for the for the for the comment. And as I, I noted earlier, that 
as policymakers the the advice from the from the scientists about having life this is NBC from studios at Richmond Hill in Kingstown. Prime Minister Gonzalez has started his address to the United Nations, so we will take you to the...